Good morning, everyone. Welcome to morning prayer for the Teen Parish of St Luke in the City. Uh, if you don't, um, if, if you haven't been before and you don't know who I am, I'm Miranda Philpott Holmes. I'm the team rector of the of the Teen Parish, uh, doing morning prayer live from home. Welcome as you're joining us. Hi everyone, great to have too many names coming up quickly to, uh, to say hello individually. Just say, as we're gathering, I've seen Richard's names up there. Um, I've had two things uh, sent to me already for our Pentecost art project. Um, if you don't know what I'm talking about, then have a look on the um, Facebook page to see uh, the poster that Richard's done calling out four pieces of of art reflecting on Pentecost in any way you like. I've had um, I've had some photographs I've had uh, from Dave and I've had a beautiful pencil drawing sent to me in the post by Edward Egan so um, keep those coming. And we've um, just as we're gathering still I'll do notices and um, we're finishing the book of Philippians today going to be having these, the second part of the fourth chapter and we've been having a, a little bit of a discussion or poll on Facebook about what we're going to do next um, and um, the clear winner I think, uh, so sorry to those who, <laughs> who are disappointed, is we're going to work through the book of Acts next which is something that we should be using in the lectionary every Sunday um, really it's one of the ones that we're meant, we are meant to read every Sunday but because of what we're doing here we're just having one reading on a Sunday. So we'll work through the book of Acts, which covers Ascension and Pentecost and all those parts of the church season now. Um, there was also quite a lot of, um, this, this very much runner-up was, was to go back to Exodus. So what we might do is do that afterwards. And some interest in looking more at Paul's letters. Um, so maybe we'll do that after that. We'll see how we go. Someone's asking uh, the deadline for the art project. Um, have a look at the at the post that Richard put on the Facebook page. I think it's the 24th, which is the week before Pentecost, so that we can um, pull things together. Edward sent me a, a drawing in the post. It was lovely to get real posts. <laughs> so welcome as we gather. I've kept the ferns and the bluebells from yesterday up behind me. Let's join together in our gathering prayer. We come into this time and space and offer ourselves, our time and these moments of stillness to God. We leave aside for this while our cares and concerns, our fears and frustrations. Or if we cannot lay them aside, we bring them with us into this space and offer them to God. to burn the bluebell. We light this candle as a symbol of our faith and hope for our future as a parish, our future as a people, our future in this pandemic. We trust in the alchemy of the Holy Spirit to bring her dream to life here among us. Gather your people, O God, that your dream for us may come true. Amen. Alleluia. Christ is risen. Refresh our insight, living one. Help us to become children again, alive to the newness and wonder of things, ready to ask the troubling questions. 
Refresh our compassion, loving one. Help us to build a world of inclusion, where many voices, bodies and experiences weave together the web of justice. Refresh our rage, challenging one. Help us to resist the forces of enslavement and empire, the colonising of peoples and the killing of the earth and its creatures. Help us to hear you now in the song of the earth and the words of its prophets. So we're going to finish the book of Philippians. This is the first time we've got through an entire book. It is a short one. It's a good way to start. So in Philippians chapter four, um, verses 10 to the end. And like the end of, um, of many letters, this is a, a collection of bits and pieces. So there's not one consistent narrative going through this, so, so bear with that. We're beginning to read at verse 10. I rejoiced greatly in the Lord, that at last you renewed your concern for me. Indeed, you were concerned, but you had no opportunity to show it. I am not saying this because I am in need, for I have learnt to be content whatever the circumstances. I know what it is to be in need, and I know what it is to have plenty. I have learnt the secret of being content in any and every situation, whether well-fed or hungry, whether living in plenty or in want. I can do all this through him who gives me strength. Yet it was good of you to share in my troubles. Moreover, as you Philippians know, in the early days of your acquaintance with the gospel, when I set out from Macedonia, not one church shared with me in the matter of giving and receiving, except you only. For even when I was in Thessalonica, you sent me aid more than once when I was in need. Not that I desire your gifts. What I desire is that more be credited to your account. I have received full payment and have more than enough. I am amply supplied now that I have received from Epaphroditus the gift you sent. They are a fragrant offering, an acceptable sacrifice, pleasing to God. And my God will meet all your needs according to the riches of his glory in Christ Jesus. To our God and Father be glory for ever and ever. Amen. Greet all God's people in Christ Jesus. The brothers and sisters who are with me send greetings. All God's people here send you greetings, especially those who belong to Caesar's household. The grace of the Lord Jesus Christ be with your spirit. Amen. It'll be interesting to see in the comments um, what, what you make of that and which which bits of that uh, seem to speak to you in particular. Um, to me, I think we can divide it into, into three sections, three main things. Um, and I wonder which one jumped out at you most. There's that first part where Paul talks about being content, whatever the circumstances. This, a, large, a large part of this is effectively a thank you letter for some gifts, presumably some money gifts, maybe other things that were sent from the church in, in Philippi to, uh, to Paul earlier. And he's, he's now writing his, his thank you letter um, in a slightly awkward way. I don't know enough about um, letter writing conventions in, um, in the ancient Roman world to know whether this was the sort of, sort of standard way in which you said thank you or whether um, Paul's doing something very different here. If anyone does know about that, I'd be interested to hear in the comments. But he starts by um, talking about how he's learnt to be content, that they don't need to give him things because he can cope. <laughs> he's he's learnt to be content whatever the circumstances. And that, I think, is quite an interesting point. Um, today is the feast in the Church of England of Julian of Norwich, um, an anchoress who lived in the Middle Ages um, and spent her life in a small one-room 
cottage hermitage attached to the church with two windows. One window onto the church where she could see services rather like we're doing now. It's quite interesting isn't it when we talk about going back to church that actually in what we're doing now, speaking through this window, hearing each other through the window, uh, is just what Julian spent her entire life doing. And her other window onto the world where she could hear people's prayer concerns and spend her time praying for them. There's something about that monastic sense of contentment, which is problematic. It's problematic when it's used um, by those who are well off to tell those who aren't well off that they should be comfortable with what they've got. Um, but it's also it's also quite interesting if we if we don't use it as a stick to beat other people with, but if we simply use it as something to reflect on ourselves. So that's the first part. Then the second part, um, Paul's specifically talking about Christian giving. Um, it's the it's one of the six words in our diocesan rule of life that, um, particularly those of you who've been involved in the baptism and confirmation preparation that we've done recently um, will know about. Read, the inner journey of read, pray, learn, and the outer journey of tell, serve, give. And again, giving often has a bit of a bad press um, among Christians, particularly if you've been through um, churches and experiences that have been abusive around the way they've demanded um, giving in an unhealthy way to support lavish lifestyles. But giving is an important part of our Christian discipline because it's about recognising that what we have is all gift. It's all gift from God of which we are stewards. It's not simply things that we've earned because we're really good and we've worked really hard and so on. We're only able to do that if we are because of the, the health and the intellectual gifts or the physical gifts or the craftsman skills that, that we've got. And those among us who aren't able to do that are no less worthwhile. Um, any of us, as we, as we know in this current illness, any of us could be struck down uh, physically or mentally at any time. And that helps us to realise that what we have is for sharing. And I think it's something that in a way our society is learning at the moment as people all around the country, um, obviously there are some people who are hoarding and profiteering, but many more people who are generously sharing what they've got, their time, their ability to go out, their cups of flour with their neighbours. And Paul is quite clear that they're not giving because he needs it. They're giving because that's good for them. It helps have a healthy... Giving helps us to create and to develop a healthy attitude to money. So someone's saying, uh, yeah, Yvonne's saying, stewardship of God's gifts was the theme of Richard Raw's daily reflection today. So that would be worth having a look at if you're not signed up to those. And then finally, it's easy to ignore um, in this letter the final greetings. It's like, oh yeah, 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 that's just how a letter ends. It's fascinating. I mean, with a historical hat on, this is absolutely fascinating. All the people here send you greetings, especially those belonging to Caesar's household. How many of us would have imagined if we thought about Paul in prison in Rome and the people he'd be in connection with and the, the early Christians there, that some of the people belonging to Caesar's household, some of the people in the palace, and we've no idea whether they were, I don't know, the, the stewards of the banquets or the, the, the lowliest scullery maid, who knows? But some of the people in the palace, enough of them to be described in a group like this, all God's people here send you greetings, especially those who belong to Caesar's household. That sounds like there's a, there's a group, a house church, happening in the heart of the palace. That's a really fascinating historical detail. Um, and and I, 
I just find that incredible, this glimpses of people meeting in so many different circumstances and contexts back then, just as we are now. So as I say, it'd be interesting to see which of those parts most strikes you. I wasn't able to look at all your comments while I was talking, so I'm just going to scroll back at them. Yes, that's right. God will provide for all your needs is an easy thing to say, isn't it? It's an easy... It's a thing that is often used to dismiss people's desire for help. But here it's, it's very much held in context with the call to generosity. God doesn't provide our needs by snapping his fingers and uh, things falling out of the air. My needs were provided for when I wasn't able to go out and shout by the Red Cross bringing a parcel because I'd registered as vulnerable and now by an Asda delivery slot that's going to arrive soon. That's as much provision because we have a society that cares about vulnerable people. I know some people um, from texts and emails I've had uh, are struggling a little bit with how, at the moment, with how we can be generous, with feeling that we should be being generous and yet our own circumstances make that difficult, either because we've got um, little money to give at the moment, our own employment is insecure, or because we simply can't go out and do the helpful things that we would normally have done. This isn't to say that we need to do things that we can't do. And it's really important to be clear that our worth, our worth to God, our worth to society does not depend on what we can contribute to it. God isn't made any better by the addition um, of our giving or our generosity. And if what you can give is simply praying for other people, maybe making a phone call. If you can't make a phone call, sometimes just, sometimes just keeping going is your offering. We do have a tendency to want to be useful. I think it's a particularly Christian vice as well as a virtue because it's so easy to end up judging ourselves and others and to feel that we're being judged by others um, by how useful we're being on some measurable scale. That is absolutely not what this is saying. So let's take all those thoughts and reflections and discussion that we've had. Um, if you're watching this later on YouTube or on Facebook, then do read through the comments. Um, I'm letting them speak for themselves rather than reading them all out. Um, but there's a lot of wisdom in there. So let's take all those thoughts and reflections into our prayers of intercession.
God, you are the burning heart of being, ablaze with love and freedom. May all we hold in prayer be held in this never-ceasing gift of life. May we carry that light, that flame, that miracle into every place of death and despair. And so we bring our prayers of intercession, the people, the places, the situations that are on our hearts today. Thinking of Julian of Norwich, I'd like to begin by praying for all those who are, well, first of all, for all those who are literally in, um, in monasteries or in hermitages and thank God for their life and their witness and their commitment and for the way they model in the religious life how we don't necessarily need to be obviously useful, economically contributing to be of value to God. But also all those who are in involuntary hermitages at the moment, for all those who all they can do is look out of the window, who long to be able to go out and interact with people again. And pray for something of that contentment that passes all understanding to fill their hearts and minds. Amen. Pray for all those um, in care homes, unable to see family and friends, and for the staff who are often living in the homes with them to keep them safe, working very hard, often with inadequate support. As we think about giving, can I pray for four churches, for our diocese and for all charities who are really concerned about um, giving to their to their charities, to their to their work and how that's going to bear up in the um, in the economic depression that's almost inevitably going to take place as people's incomes 
um, are affected and people's job security are affected and for all the work that they will struggle to continue. I pray that those who do have um, stable and secure incomes will be able to be generous to, um, to help meet that shortfall. Amen. We close with a prayer for the E Day. Almighty God, we thank you for all those who gave their lives or a good portion of their lives in the service of this country and to secure the freedoms and the quality of life that we enjoy today. For those who died, but also for those who served and survived. Um, but who had lost years and often mental health, whose family life was affected, and for all those who worked at home. Give thanks particularly here in Liverpool for all those who worked on the Western Approaches front, all those who worked in the port and in maintaining supplies. And currently for the Western Approaches visitor attraction and for all they've been doing online to support learning and schools in this time. We pray for all who we remember today and for all those who will be deeply saddened by not being able to have the, the celebrations and the ceremonies that they were looking forward to. In Jesus' name, Amen. So let's gather together all our thoughts and prayers, the prayers in the comments, the prayers that we've held in the silence of our own hearts, in the words of the Lord's Prayer. To use the version I'm going to use from our service sheet, or whichever version you know or have to hand. Divine Mother, Divine Father, to be in you is to be in heaven. May we hear the wonder that echoes in your name. May we accept no rule but the rule of love. May we never tolerate the evil of hunger. May the hurts we cause be forgiven and the hurts we receive be healed. May we remember that we are fragile and cherish the life we share with all. For all love and life and power is the gift of the Spirit. Amen. In the circle of God's love, we are one. The circle is never broken. In the light of God's welcome, we are one. The light never goes out. Let the child teach us the value of play. Let the adults teach us the gentleness of care. May the circle surround us while we are apart. May the light draw us together again. Amen.
Amen. Thank you for joining with us for morning prayer today. Tomorrow um, being Saturday, uh, Lily Minelli will be taking morning prayer here on this same Facebook page. Um, and then on Sunday, I'll be offering a service of Holy Communion here. And then on Monday, we'll gather again for morning prayer and we'll begin our journey through the book of Acts. Um, it's a fairly substantial book, so we'll, we'll perhaps try and do it in slightly larger chunks, but it, it really depends on the particular story and episode that's, um, that's being told. I, I like reading a whole section rather than just random bits. So I will see you all again, or I'll see you in the comments tomorrow, and I'll see you all again, um, not quite face to face, but face to your profile pics. Um, I do like it when people have their actual picture in the profile because it means that we are face to face. I'll see you again on Sunday. Bye.